Hi, everyone, and welcome to Masterclass Live. This is a weekly series that allows you to connect directly with our instructors. For those of you new to our community, Masterclass is a place where you can learn from the world's best minds and about things as varied as writing a book or making a Michelin star quality meal or figuring out how to think critically about what's going on in the world right now. Our online catalog spans more than 80 classes with luminaries like Spike Lee and Natalie Portman and David Sedaris. And today, I'm delighted to welcome the irrepressible Sarah Blakely to Masterclass Live. Sarah is the founder and CEO of Spanx, a company she started with just $5,000 in the bank and built into a worldwide phenomenon. She's been named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, the world's youngest self-made female billionaire. Wow. And my personal favorite, the Michael Jordan of women's underwear. Sarah <laughs> our widely beloved class on self-taught entrepreneurship, and she's joined today by her husband and fellow entrepreneur, Jesse, who's going to be running the show today and asking some of the many amazing questions you submitted. Sarah and Jesse, thank you guys so much for being here today. Yes, thank you for having me. <laughs> is this the first for you too? Is this, Sarah, is this your first time being interviewed by your husband? I think so. I mean... Is this the first time you've ever interviewed me, honey? Uh, this is the first time I've ever interviewed you. You interview me at dinner all the time. Yeah, that's true. Roles, I like to play. The roles are reversed. I like to play the feelings game at the dinner table, and everybody has to go around and talk about how they're feeling, and it's my husband's favorite game. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I love that game also. <laughs> uh, I'm not a great communicator like that. I mean, that's like giving me kryptonite. <laughs> well, See, I have Sarah. to do it by trying to make it a game. I'm like, there's this really fun game we're going to play, and it's called the feelings game, I'm trying to appeal to my husband's inner child. And anyway, it's been, it's been very funny. This is a very particular yeah. thing for you to reference when you're about to be in the hot seat for the next 45 minutes. Exactly. Um, I want to say before I leave you guys to it, your class is um, so widely beloved, but also really beloved by me. I think it's just brimming with vulnerability and charm and then so many practical takeaways. It's no surprise that we got heaps and heaps of amazing questions. I'm going to leave Jesse to sort of start wading through some of those um, and I'll see you guys on the other side. All right. Thank you. Irina, before we get started, I just want to congratulate you on your on your five year anniversary of Masterclass. I've personally been a big fan. And you just got Ron Finley, the Gangster Garden is one of my favorites. So I can't wait to watch that course. I've learned so much. And I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight uh, live. I'm really excited about this. I just wanna say before we start that I'm so lucky to be married to Sarah. Sarah is just in every bucket of her life from wife to daughter to sister to CEO, founder, friend, um, granddaughter. She's just, she's a 10 out of 10 in every bucket. And um, I always like to say that Sarah is 50% one, one, Einstein and 50% Lucille Ball. And <laughs> you can solve the most complicated problems, uh, you know, in the business world and create amazing products that people want. Um, and sometimes it's a hard time pulling out of the garage and figuring out like directions to stuff we do all the time. That, that's the Lucille Ball part. The other part is the Einstein. I'd say 60% Einstein. So um, I'm just very happy to have the opportunity to be here and, uh, and spend this time and flip the roles and get to interview my wife. So thank you, sweetie, for joining us. Yeah. So I, I, I watched your masterclass. Um, I actually get a, a front row view into how you, you know, parent and how you run your business and how you ideate and all that stuff. And I was shocked. Um, just you provide so many immediate actionable takeaways in this course. And it was the first time you've ever done it. I'm really, I'm curious what it was like to sit down and film this amazing uh, product and session for a masterclass. Well, I mean, it was, it's, you're right. It was the first time I've ever done anything like this. And so when Masterclass asked me to do it, I obviously wanted to really be thoughtful about it. And 
Um, for me, part of the reason why I did it is because people have been asking me for 20 years for 15 minutes of my time, as you know. And I, as you know, I want to give everybody 15 minutes of my time, but I just truly can't. I mean, we have four small children running a business. So this was sort of a really great way for me to answer that and, and then give so much more. And so the process of creating this masterclass for me was very personal. I spent several months with time allocated on my calendar to kind of excavate all of the little nuances and insights that I had earned and learned over the years and applied in creating Spanx and in growing Spanx. And so it was a really cool opportunity for me to kind of really put down on paper my thoughts on what would I teach someone else on how to do what I did. And um, I was really vulnerable in it, you know? I, I, I was humbled by it because I hadn't done that before. And there is, like you said, there's a moment in the masterclass where I actually get choked up <laughs> and I tear up. And um, they said, Sarah, can we put that in there? And I said, really? And they said, I said, okay, sure. But it's at the very end of it. And I think it was just the culmination of me really thinking about it. Because when you all know your entrepreneurs who are tuning in, I'm guessing most of you are, you're going, going, going. You're hitting that next milestone. You're achieving that next thing. We're drivers, we're doers. And it doesn't really hit us um, very much, the what we've accomplished or what we've been able to do. And so um, I definitely experienced one of those moments when I was filming Masterclass. Yeah, you know, they, we have hundreds of questions that came in. I'm gonna get to as many as I can um, and be mindful of everybody that submitted questions. But I had a quick question. You know, there's so many golden nuggets in here. I mean, it's really, I always say, this is like a going to Harvard Business School in a very compact way. I mean, and you cover things from the work that you did before Spanx to things, everything from sales and coming up the creative process. And what I love about you, sweetie, is you never took a business class. You grew up on Clearwater Beach. You, know, <laughs> you were surrounded by oceans and parties. How did you learn all this stuff? Like, where did this come from? I mean, was it, is it intuitive? I mean, clearly it's teachable, but I never see you really studying. How did you learn all this stuff? Well, since the age of 16, I have become a student of how to think as I've meant, you know, I, I had a series of tragedies happen to me in high school and it led me to listen to Wayne Dyer and Wayne Dyer was an inspirational, motivational speaker. And he talked about visualization, manifesting what you want in your life, law of attraction, not fearing failure. And I literally had this epiphany as a 16 year old that I've just spent 16 years of my life in school being taught what to think but no one has ever taught me how to think. And I was like, wait, I'm in control of that. I can actually teach myself how to think and I could possibly train my brain to think in a way that would make me more productive, more successful, you know, not fall down and not be able to get back up with an obstacle. So I've been training my brain for such a long time on when an obstacle happens and it happens to all of us and especially entrepreneurs, it happens daily and sometimes multiple times a day. Um, my brain just immediately goes to where's the blessing, where's the hidden gift. And I immediately, instead of letting it, you know, paralyze me, uh, I let it fuel me and, you know, it doesn't mean I don't feel things deeply and have my moment of grief or just like, oh my gosh, but I think that that's such a big part of this and I didn't know how it was supposed to be done and I think if people will honor their own path and listen to that inner gut and have the confidence to just do it in a way that they think is right without a script, you know? No, I didn't go to business school. And I think because I'd been doing all of that training on how to think, it gave me the courage to try to do it even though I didn't have experience. <clears throat> because most people who don't have experience, as you know, they hear, we all hear the self-doubt. Like, you're not an expert. What makes you think you're going to have the answer? If no one else has done this, why in the world do you think you can do it? I mean, I hear that talk track like everybody else does, but um, because I've been doing so much inner work on my mindset, I think I just went ahead with it anyway. And in order to do anything su substantial in life, you've got to do it different than everyone else did. That's the only way to be innovative and it's the only way to break ground. If you do it exactly the way anyone else is doing it or even the way someone taught you to do it, you're probably not gonna end up being 
someone that changes culture, changes history, and ultimately could change the world. And entrepreneurs are people who invent things or make things better than they already were. And I love entrepreneurs. They're my favorite people. I mean, they're the backbone of our community. And you're an entrepreneur. I married one. You're a serial entrepreneur. You do it in many, many different categories. I've kind of stayed in one lane. But I, I feel like I'm self-taught and in, in listening to my intuition and, and having the confidence to go the course. Yeah, I think that's something that you've mastered. Like you're so good at trusting your gut in all buckets, business, but that translates into all the buckets. This question came in from the masterclass folks, and I love this because um, being having come from the music business, I know how hard it is to have a hit, and I know it's even harder to have multiple hits, but you've had many hits on the product side and you have to keep coming up with new ideas and being creative. So it, in, the, in your master class, you, know, you talk a lot about the tools that you use to develop big ideas. Um, one of them is you let your mind wander for you know, an hour or two a day in the car. You created a fake commute. And since a lot of people today have more time than usual to let their minds wander at home, how can they use this situation to help develop their ideas? Well, I mean, you mentioned the think time. Think time to me is really important. And I don't, what I'm talking about is not going through your list of things to do at work or your chores in the home. It's like, where does your mind wander? Because when it just wanders with no agenda and you're almost in this sort of quasi daydream state, that's where really magic happens. That's where sparks fly. That's where like you're being channeled. I feel like there's a connection that's happening between you and the universe. And um, I'll, I get flooded with ideas when I'm in that state. You know, since being at home for a significant period of time and with four small children, um, my creativity and my idea flow has not been what I would love for it to be. But my creativity has sort of shifted into full-blown mom mode and i'm coming up with creative things to do with the children and creative you know activities from storytelling and i'm going to start this story and i want you guys to finish the story to um, scavenger hunts in the backyard or on a beach so um, my mind is kind of working in other ways right now because it's really sort of been um, all hands on deck at home as you know <laughs> i mean our children are 10, two that are five, and a four-year-old. Yeah. Well, I've watched you switch your create. You're like, I love it because I get this front row seat, but I've watched you channel a lot of the entrepreneurial creativity into our home. And our kids are super lucky because <laughs> there's a scavenger hunt going on or you have an idea to do this. And on a rainy day, you know, you let them, you let them be bored, which is, I know is a big part of your childhood, you know, having just being creative on your own and not being overscheduled and, you know, incorporating it now when the kids, you know, when the kids are, are home, has been fun to watch. I also, I failed to say in the intro when I was talking very quickly about you, you know, uh, for those that don't know, um, you know, Sarah has been incredibly philanthropic from the start of her business and um, does a lot behind the scenes, does a lot in a lot of different areas and just recently made an amazing donation through a, a charity arm that she set up called the Red Backpack Fund. And we got a couple of questions that came in. This would probably be a great time to just take a minute or two, sweetie, and just tell everybody about, sorry, the sweetie thing. We're married, if anyone is just joining. Um, <laughs> tell everyone a little bit about the Red Backpack Fund and how it works and who it's helping. Yeah, sure. So um, the Red Backpack Fund is uh, an opportunity for me to pay it forward and help female entrepreneurs, especially during this time. And um, I have donated $5 million directly to female entrepreneurs. There will be 5,000 different entrepreneurs that will, excuse me, 1,000 different entrepreneurs that will receive $5,000 each. And $5,000 is the amount of savings I had set aside from selling fax machines door to door for seven years um, that I used to start Spanx. So the number is symbolic and the lucky red backpack. Each woman will receive a lucky red backpack because I started Spanx with my lucky red backpack. And um, it now hangs on the wall at Spanx headquarters in a glass box. But 
It was with me every step of the way for probably the first seven years. I didn't carry a purse. It was always this dingy red East Pack backpack from college. And I believed it was lucky. So it went with me everywhere. And it's sort of symbolic of just starting small and dreaming big and the importance of that. And it's also symbolic of like everything you need is really right there already on your back. And there's just so, so much that I want to do to help uh, entrepreneurs. And I am a small business owner. I still act like a small business owner. I know exactly what it feels like, even now that Spanx is 20 years old. And um, I just wanted to offer a helping hand during this time. I just want to say that um, take this opportunity. You mentioned that you started Spanx with $5,000 in savings, which obviously I know. But I'm yeah. going to share this with you on this masterclass exclusive interview. You know, I just think that's so unbelievable because most entrepreneurs go right to like, I need to raise money or I don't have enough money. They go to, I can't, I need, you know, how do I get? You started this with $5,000 in savings. And I just want to say, I think about this all the time. There's 7 billion humans on this planet. If you gave all 7 billion, I'm sorry, $5,000 in savings and said, start an idea. Not a lot of people will be able to do what, you, what you've done. And to share those secrets with everybody in the course is really a gift. So I just want to thank you for that. And um, now let's get into the questions. So these are submitted from folks that took the course. So congratulations, you're a handful of 7 billion, sweetie. Um, the, first yeah. question, yeah, yeah. the first question comes from Serena. And Serena says, Sarah, how do you stay focused and motivated? And what promises do you make to yourself? How do you stay focused and motivated? And what promises do you make to yourself? How do I say, say it again? How do you stay focused and motivated, but you're incredibly motivated? And what promises do you make to yourself? Um, well, I stay focused and motivated. I stay focused by, um, you know, I try, I track my, my priorities daily and quarterly and annually, but I stay motivated because um, I'm connected to a purpose bigger than myself. And I believe that the entrepreneurial journey is hard. I mean, it is, the one thing people don't talk about is how hard you work. I mean, in many cases I tell people, <laughs> it's really who wanted to work the hardest and who had the most staying power and grit to just keep going. Um, because there is a huge element of this that is that. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day, I'm like, I didn't take a vacation for like 10 years. I mean, I was just working when all my friends were going on vacations and people were going out to parties. I just wasn't. So it was just a lot of commitment on that end. But what, why I was willing to do that and why I still stay motivated is because for me, I've been doing this for something greater than myself. It's, I'm very passionate about women and helping women and supporting women. I believe I'm very lucky to be a woman born in the right place at the right time. And so I feel this deep gratitude and I almost feel that gratitude daily throughout the day. And it fuels me to keep going. So it reminds me you know, that when I'm doing something for Spanx, whether it was cold calling Neiman Marcus to get in my foot in the door or you know, try to land a big account or go in front of a bunch of customers or give a speech, all those things scared me, but I stayed motivated because I felt like I was walking through the door on behalf of women and behalf of women that came before me that didn't have this opportunity and on behalf of women still around the world right now who don't have the opportunity that I have just because they're a woman. And so I, I suggest, and I talk about this in my master class, like what is your purpose? Your purpose is going to get you through this. And your purpose needs to be bigger than I just want money and I just want to be successful so I can like buy things. That's great. That does happen if you are really successful. But if that's the main motivation, it's a lot harder to have that really deep staying power and motivation. So, um, uh, you know, the, your purpose is kind of the intersection between, you know, um, what do you like to do? What brings you joy? Like, what are you good at? What brings you joy? And how can you best serve the world? And um, 
a lot of times I talk about, if someone's like, I don't know what I'm passionate about, I talk about, well, what makes you cry? You know, what, what really affects you? And whatever that is, pay attention to that because your purpose probably lies within that or around there. And for me, seeing women not be able to fulfill their own potential is really deeply affects me. I would also add just that, you know, in watching you, you put a lot of heart and soul into your products, into your community, into everything that you do. And part of the motivation just comes from, as an outsider, you know, it's just like you have passion for what you're doing and for the products and take a lot of pride in it. Um, all right, Rosa asks, how do I convince a customer they need what I'm selling to improve an aspect of their life they didn't usually, and they don't usually invest in? Um, well, you know, for one, I would say I'm, I'm not really trying to convince someone. I think you got to be careful about, I'm trying to convince this customer they need the product. I like to use myself. I created a product that I needed and that I wanted and that really deeply changed the way that I wore clothes and affected my life. So that made it easy for me to speak about myself and invite other people into that. Um, you know, kind of, this is what it's done for me. But I like to say that you should be selling the problem that you're solving and not the product. So people are far more emotional about their problems. Start with the why, start with the, the, you know, make them feel a little bit of the pain. For me, it was like, do you own white pants or do you have anything in your closet that you just don't wear, but you spend a lot of money on because you can't figure out what to wear under it. Everything shows. And immediately, you know, the woman would lean in because I knew like there's not a woman on the planet that doesn't have that situation. I didn't start with, here's my product, here's my features. I wanted to start with like, here was the problem. Here's my why I did this. I did this to solve this problem. And um, that made a big difference in how I could get consumers to want to try it because my product was brand new. I mean, no one had ever heard of footless pantyhose. No one was searching the planet for footless pantyhose. So not only did I invent something new, and it was also a new brand, Spanx, that no one had ever heard of, but I was trying to explain and, and show people why they would need this. And um, I always say a quick visual is really impactful. If you can show a before and after, if you can show a with my product, without my product, that's always super powerful. And always focus on the what's in it for them. I, it's called W-I-F, what's in it for me? W-I-I-F-M. Um, and that's in my brain always. Like whenever I'm talking to somebody, I'm thinking, what's in it for them? Like, what am I even, why am I even talking to them? What am I going to offer them that's going to help them? And I pay attention to the things that they say and need. And I focus on what I truly believe I can offer that will help them. I'm so glad Masterclass chose you to kick off the entrepreneurial series because these are like unbelievable gems that you can use in any part of your journey and you cover it all in the course. So if you're just joining us, this is a live interview between me. It's very awkward for me. I'm interviewing my wife, Sarah Blake, <laughs> founder of Spanx. Uh, we're not in the same house right now, so that's weird too, um, but it's exciting. So thank you for joining us. And we have hundreds of questions that have been submitted and I'm just trying to get to as many as I can um, with Sarah. So Sarah, Natana asks, in the last five years, what new belief, behavior, or habit has improved your life? Well, uh, in the last five years, one of the things that I implemented in my life that has made the biggest difference was I started bucketing my days. Prior to bucketing my days, I literally was, I was so drained at the end of every day because as an entrepreneur, you know that you're dealing with you know, in one hour, I'd be dealing with a legal issue. And then 10 minutes later, I'd be trying on a bra and giving feedback. And then 30 minutes later, I'm, I have an employee issue coming to me that I need to weigh in on. And what I realized was at the, I felt like just people were shooting arrows at me all day. And I would come home every day and just literally stare at the wall. And I stopped enjoying it. I was not fulfilled and I wasn't enjoying my journey in the company. And I thought, okay, part of what's bothering me is I don't have enough context 
And my brain is having to jump so quickly from subject to subject that I literally had like monkey brain. Like I couldn't focus, I was foggy. And I'll give you an example of not having context. Like someone would come in my office and say, we have to make a big decision on packaging. Do you want the blue or the red? And I'd stare at them and I'd go, I want the blue, the blue looks better. And then they leave and then it gets launched and it's right next to our main competitor and their package is blue. And I'm like, oh my God, I never would have picked blue. Like, It shouldn't be blue. Our competition's blue right next to us. But that kept happening because I wasn't asking the right questions and because I wasn't giving and allowing time for context. So, um, so I'll tell you what I did. Like Monday is my free think day. I catch up with loose ends. Tuesday is um, creative day, brand day, and marketing. Wednesday is meeting with leadership team day and vision for the company. And Thursday's product day. And Friday's a swing day for me. So now I've trained everybody in the company. They like it better because they're like, all product issues go to Sarah on Thursdays. And it at least it allows my brain to stay in one subject for an extended period of time. And it's made, I'm happier. It makes a bigger difference. Um, I also, uh, a lot by, by doing that and taking control of my, my buckets in my days, I, for 19 years of owning Spanx, every year I would say to my, um, uh, my team, I would say, guys, I'm going to start working out. And you can attest to this, Jesse. You are amazing at working out. If there's something I really admire is how disciplined you are about your self-care in that bucket. And every year I would not work out, ever. And this last year I said to them, guys, I'm working out this year and I hope you find time for me to work. <laughs> And we started by finding the exact hour every day that was going to be a non-negotiable. And once I put that on the calendar, everything else just worked around it. And it's the first year that I worked out. And that's another habit I did for myself that has made a huge difference. Now, can you do that at every stage of the business? Maybe not. I mean, for the first seven years, I was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it may have been harder for me to do that. But just by prioritizing it, and working around it, it made, it made it happen for me in my life. And then um, working on self-doubt and negative self-talk. I listen to motivational stuff. I, I read positive books on Instagram. I don't follow that many people, but some of the things that I follow are positive quote message you know, pages. I like my feed to be filled with stuff that makes me feel good and makes me think glass half full. I would also say as a family, I would think, you know, we're very um, intentional about the words that we say. We try to encourage our kids not to say I can't, which means I won't. We try to watch what we say, um, keep it super positive. Uh, my friend Chad Wright always says, you know, once you speak things, you, you, thoughts, you give them power. So, and that works positive and negative. So we really work on that as a family too. Um, I'm really glad that Gwendolyn asked this question. I'm going to read it. She sent it in because I don't think a lot of people know that you are on a show called The Rebel Billionaire. When I first met you, uh, I couldn't even watch these tapes. You can talk a little bit about that. Uh, why don't you just real quick, before I even ask this question, can you tell everybody about this show that you were on? Because it was like, I never saw it because I couldn't handle the pressure. I even though I know you lived, I couldn't watch it. I know. You still have never seen it. You watched half of the first episode and that's all you've seen of that whole show. Because I don't want our kids to get any ideas. No, this was even before kids. You just couldn't handle it. Like you said, it was too stressful for you. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah was on it. You want to just take one second? Yeah, sure. So I was on a television show with Sir Richard Branson, the um, entrepreneur from England that started Virgin, the Virgin Empire. And... Um, I read his book in college, Losing My Virginity, and thought, this is a really cool guy. I'd like to know him one day. So I sort of put it on my manifest list and started manifesting it and putting it out into the universe that one day he and I would be friends. And then fast forward all these years, he announces he's having a reality show, um, kind of like The Apprentice, but instead of each episode taking place in one city, each episode would take place in a different part around the world. And they were all business challenges. 
And instead of going to the boardroom, if you didn't make the challenge and getting fired, you had to do basically a world record breaking debt defined stunt. And <laughs> I signed up for it. I was one of 18 entrepreneurs. I ended up spending two months traveling the world with Richard Branson. It was the most insane things you can imagine. The very first day of filming, I was in England. The day before I was in Atlanta in the Starbucks line, like ordering my chai tea. Then the very next day I'm awoken at three in the morning in the English countryside by this team of people that said, wake up, wake up. They put us in hot air balloons and we went up 10,000 feet in the air with a balance beam connecting the two hot air balloons. And we had to walk across the hot air balloon without touching anything on the balance beam. And you, you, you have a crazy fear of heights. Can I, let me ask the question because that's a perfect segue. I do have a crazy fear of heights. So, so Gwendolyn asks, besides having to walk the tight ropes between two hot air balloons at 10,000 feet while trying out for the show, what scared you the most during your time as an entrepreneur? And, and would you tell every woman, what would you tell every woman are your three greatest habits that have helped you along your trajectory? Well, um, the, the, okay, so the first part is what has scared me the most. Um, I would say what has scared me the most throughout the years uh, is when I felt like the company was um, getting off course and getting uh, a little bit away from its purpose and its values that was originally set. And I think that's very normal. I think that happens to cultures inside of a company throughout years. And I think it happens when you bring in different leaders and leadership, it can take on different tones. And, um, and so that, that has been something that scares me, but I've, I can tell you that I've been able to, you know, really, I call it setting the rudder, like, the founder and CEO that starts the business it needs to be the one that really sets the rudder, okay? Um, if, if you're a ship headed to Africa or somewhere and your rudder is off by even a few millimeters, over time, you're gonna end up in like a whole nother place than you're aiming for. And so um, I've, I've gotten good throughout the years of knowing, I, I kind of, it's an intuitive feeling I can sense when the rudder's off. Um, so that is something that I pay attention to. Um, things that scare me are when products don't come in right. You know, I care so deeply about the customer. If I feel that we disappoint the customer, that scares me. Um, you know, I like to make sure that we can rectify all of those situations when they happen, but they still deeply affect me when they do. No, no company's perfect. No person is perfect. But what you can do is stay true to your value system of how you're going to handle it and how you're going to treat people when things don't go right. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? And you can add any of this if you want to. Yeah, but just some of the habits uh, that helped you along the way. You covered a lot of it. Um, that you would encourage others to, you know, to have similar habits. I think you've touched upon a lot of that. Yeah. Um, you know, the, my, the habits that I have um, that I would say are really helpful throughout this journey are taking the time to think, which I did talk about, um, uh, keeping a good cadence with your um, leaders and your leadership team inside of the organization, staying connected to them in uh, a meaningful way, making sure that you're all sharing the same vision and that they feel supported. Um, habits like, you know, trying to take a little bit of time to work out has been a really big shift for me. Um, and balancing, you know, trying to balance it every day is different. I mean, some days I feel like I'm really balancing it great. And then other days, as you know, I'm crying and saying, Jesse, I can't do this or I can't handle it. And you're always like, honey, you got this. But there's ups and downs like that. So um, one of the habits that I've had is I have sort of my own board. They don't even really know they're my board, but they're my feel good board. So when I know I'm going kind of in that downward, like feeling overwhelmed, I have two or three people that I are my go-tos that I'll just either call on the phone or make sure I spend time with, and um, they really help me get through it. Yeah, what I love about watching you in this course, the in the masterclass course, is, and I hope people had the same thing. 
they get a real sense of you as a person. And you know, you're somebody, the same courage it takes to walk across a tightrope on, on, sh- on this show is the same courage muscle that you need for starting a business. And you know, I think you're someone talking about habits, and I, I see this all the time, you really flex your grit muscle. You know, you, you're, a gritty, you're a gritty gal. You know, you're not scared to try things and experiment. And uh, no, it's true. It's true. You really, you know, you trust your instincts on it, but you're not scared to go out of the box. And no one's really taught you how to do this. You've, you, you picked up these skills and senses along the way. It's really fun to watch. Um, Grant asks, when thinking about scaling a business, how do you decide what key hires are most important from the early days? And would you give equity to attract higher quality talent or try to raise capital? So the way that I can just speak to how I did it, um, I was very interested in hiring people that were covered my weaknesses. You know, as you're looking when you're really small and you're like, who's going to be my first hire? Who's going to be my second hire? It's super smart to kind of say, what's my bench strength? What can I cover in the business? And what are the areas that I'm not as good at? And those were my first hire. So my first hire was an operator to kind of handle the inventory, handle the accounts receivable, handle the accounting, um, set up QuickBooks. <laughs> and, um, and then I, I didn't have like a sort of sit down strategic plan how to acquire talent as I was doing every department because that's what entrepreneurs do in the beginning. I figured where I needed more bench strength. You know, like I was calling, I was my PR person. I was it. I was calling every newspaper, every magazine. I was trying to get the word out about my product and get people to know about it. And I was also selling it on the road, the face of the brand. I was doing all these other things. And so as I was spending my time, it became clear like, well, I can't really delegate this one or I can't really hire this one. I need to stay in that lane, but this one maybe I can. And so my second hire was a head of PR and it was a girl that I went for a walk with to get a bagel and I gave her a free product and the entire walk to get the bagel. She said, this is the most amazing product. This is what I wore it with. I tried it on with 15 things in my closet. I haven't worn these things in like 10 years. I felt like I just got new clothes because of your item. I mean, she went on and on. And at the end of the walk, I was like, do you want to be my head of PR? She's like, I don't know anything about PR. I'm like, I don't either. But you just get this list of magazines and radio stations. And now it would be podcasts and influencers. And, you know, it would be Instagram, different people you follow on Instagram. um, And and reach out to them and send them product and call them. And so um, I did not hire people in the beginning. I did not raise capital to hire um, what I think the question said, you know, top talent. Um, I didn't put a lot of emphasis on that early on. I hired people that didn't have experience in what I was hiring them for, but I liked them and I thought that they were passionate and hard workers. And um, it really worked out for me in in the early days. So um, there comes a time though where you, you know, it's really just a lot of intuition along the way, you know, like I need somebody with really deep experience in this position and I'm willing to invest up front. The way that I ran my business, I never, I never ran my business to invest in things that were gonna pay out down the road. For example, you know, I was like in the moment. I, you know, how much money do I have to spend right now? That's what I'm gonna spend. How much money do I have for the next batch of inventory? That's what I'm gonna spend. And I was very small. I operated that for a very long time. And 20 years later, it worked. I've seen a lot of different business models. I've seen a lot of ways people do it. You know, a lot of people start and then they, you know, they got exponentially bigger than I was plotting along the way that I was. But then, you know, three years later, they were out of business, some of them, or they raised so much money that it became a very you know, different scenario inside of the business with debt and things like that. And I've just, I've just kept it that way. So I never got ahead of myself in that. I just want to say, I've never seen it in, in my life. I'm 50, almost 52 right now. I've never seen anyone do what you've done. I mean, with no experience to learn, to come into an industry dominated by men um, with $5,000 in savings and build this, create the products, the brand name, 
the marketing, the storyline. You're a great storyteller. You're, you know, you engage. It's just, it's just unbelievable. And um, I got to take this opportunity to say that. All right. If you're just joining, you're watching an exclusive masterclass interview with Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, happens to be my wife. I'm Jesse Itzler. We're fielding questions. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. And this one comes in from Michelle. It's very timely. Um, so I wanted to share it. Thanks, Michelle, for asking this. She says, Sarah, you did such a great job of grassroots roots efforts when you first started um, with being on site to sell your product. How would you pivot this approach during the current um, COVID-19 era that we're all you know, living in uh, for the near future? Being able to sell in person is such an asset. So Michelle would like to know your suggestion uh, for new entrepreneurs like herself on how, you know, these, how to operate in these new times or any ideas along that. Yeah, well, you just have to go where your customers are right now and your customers are online and on social. And so, you know, sitting down and having very creative ways that you can get yourself in front of the key influencers. How can you get, how can you stand out to them? Can you, do you have a product that you can send to them? Do you have a heartfelt note that you could send to them? You know, don't be afraid to ask people to help you, especially in the beginning. I asked people all the time, can you please help me? I'm just starting out this business. It would mean so much to me if I could be on your radio show or it would mean so much. Like I didn't always act like I had to be so buttoned up. Sometimes I, I would just weigh, weigh the situation and say, this might just be better to just appeal to this person's human emotion. And I have found that in the core of most people, they want to help. So don't forget that when you're reaching out and your story and your why. And if you happen to have a purpose that's greater than yourself, other people will want to help you because they'll feel it and they'll be connected to it. So it's like, hey, I'm doing this because X, Y, Z, I found there was this big need. I'm passionate about helping people in this way. I give back a portion of my proceeds in this way. You know, whatever it is, um, that also helps you um, stand out and open doors. And then, um, you know, I'll take a cue from you, Jesse. I mean, my husband <laughs> sent um, a, a box with a plate and some um, silverware in it to somebody that he wanted to have a meeting with and just said, I'd love to have a, a virtual lunch with you. So there's so many different ways that you can um, get your foot in the door with people. I think using humor is important. I remember one time along the way that I was trying to get my foot in the door somewhere and I sent a shoe to the person and said, I'd love to get my foot in the door with a note from me. So sometimes you just have to put yourself out on the limb too. But right now you have this social platform. So how are you going to use it in a, in a way that people are going to want to tune in? How are people going to want to be, remember you? And, um, and that's what I would be sitting down and writing a list on. And then I'd be asking myself, what are the top podcasts that I could talk about my product and my service on and start cold calling them? What are the top, um, you know, different platforms that I could be somehow free, freely advertising on? And I would be doing that. That's great advice. I'm really, uh, I really like this next question that came in because I think a lot of people are struggling with money to spend on advertising. I know when you started out, you had no money to advertise. So I think this will be close to home. You talk yeah. about the class as well. But Kyle asks, he says, I'm having trouble acquiring clients and I can't afford marketing right now. How can I get clients besides contacting other similar businesses and trying online? You went through this. Yeah. So he said, what was the last part you cut out? He said, how can I get clients besides contacting other similar businesses and trying online? I just remember you, you didn't have money when you started out to advertise. What did you do? I mean, I, well, first of all, I would, I'd started small and I tried to get my foot in the door one place and then I would go sell the product for them. And I would ensure that it was a home run success. And then I would use that as almost like a case study for the next place that I called. And I'd say, I just sold this at the boutique Mitzi and Romano and they sold 40 in three days or, you know, whatever. And I was the one that stood in their store and sold the 40 in three days, but I would just keep using these sort of small micro examples for the next, um, the next account that I wanted to get. 
And um, I wasn't afraid to do the selling for the people. Um, you know, when I landed Neiman Sachs and Nordstrom, I stood in the department stores um, by, you know, that were selling the product, but I, I stood there for, I'd go at um, 8.30 in the morning, do an all-store rally, and then stand there until six, six or seven at night, just selling the product for them. And people would go, what are you doing? Isn't is this, don't you have more things to do? You're the founder of this company. But I knew that getting into those accounts at that moment in time was like the Holy grail. I mean, there was no internet, there was no social media. So I made a list, a whiteboard list of what accounts I could get that would get me the most, uh, leverage, like the most sales. And I started there and then I made the list. And then once I made the list, it was like Neiman's, Nordstrom, Saks, Bloomingdale's, you know, all the way down to Walmart, Target. Like I just kind of made a whiteboard. And then I started asking myself, in what order should I call on these? And is there a strategic order in which I should call on them? And it was very apparent that it was. So, I mean, you know, today is a new day. How do you get clients without advertising? You there's you, you get out maybe you get out the whiteboard and you start saying how you know how am i going to find clients right now like is can i be on local television can i send anything to my local tv channels can i write to the newspaper could i be on a home shopping channel network which is a free commercial does my product make sense for that um, could I write an article and see about my product and other products in the industry and send it to a big magazine or outlet and see if they're willing to publish my article about, about kind of something, you know, I would just be brainstorming on lots of creative ways to do that. Yeah. I think one thing that you did was that was so smart early on is you sent product to celebrities and bloggers and influencers with creative notes and, you know, it, that was a great tool for you. Actually, it led to you uh, landing Oprah in, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel you. I had no money to advertise, none. So I became the advertisement myself. I couldn't pay a spokesperson. And I literally just started saying, where can I talk about my story? Where can I talk about my product? And, um, you know, uh, just every single account or any customer I got, I would try to think of a way that I could maybe use the customer's story to help further my story. So, you know, are you willing to give me a testimonial? Can I film you, you know, saying anything about my product or what, what it means to you? And, you know, building up kind of content that way too is really helpful. One of the themes in your masterclass course is, you know, and I've seen you do this, you talk about the importance of being able to talk about your product in an elevator pitch in a cocktail environment so people can share it girlfriend to girlfriend. Yeah. What's the best way to craft that? Like for those out there that are starting out, is there, is there a special formula behind an elevator pitch or telling your story or, you know, how, how would you recommend someone, you know, not be long winded in that? For me, it's very simple. You're great at it. For me, it's very simple. It's what, why, which is the feel the pain, and then why you're the best option very quickly. So like, what? Like, hey, I'm Sarah, and I invented this product called Spanx, you know, and then why? You know, because um, I was a frustrated consumer, and if you're anything like me, you have clothes hanging in your closet that you don't know how to wear, and all the other options out there you could see, and so I invented this, then you offer the solution. So you kind of want to say the why, talk about the problem, give them your why, and then you want to say why you're the best option. You don't want to just leave it at that. So then you would say, and the reason why my product or my solution is the very, very best is because mine actually stops below the knee when all the other options stop in the middle of the thigh, which leaves a liner bulge that you can see through your pants or your slacks. And so it would just, it was like I closed it out. And I do that even now with anything that I'm selling, you know, I, I it's like, this is what it is briefly, but like the why, and then the why it's your best option. What I love about, um, about Masterclass and what you've done is, you know, you bootstrap this, you know, and so many people are out there right now trying to be entrepreneurs, trying to figure out how to get going. And you, you know, you provide all these tools in the course. 
but you had this bootstrap mentality, $5,000, you were scrappy, you were selling in stores, you were sending packages to people, you wore every hat in every department, you know, oh, and by the way, you had a day job for a year and a half while you developed this at night. Do you still have that, like, would you say you still have that bootstrap, like, mentality do you, now that you have all these products and distribution and a big team? You still seem to operate so gritty. Well, what do you think? <laughs> I know the answer, but I'm interviewing you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I cannot take the bootstrap and girl out of me. It does not matter what stage I am in business. I mean, I am literally like, I'm really focused on ROI, return on investment. Even now I'll say, why did we spend that? And what exactly did we get in return? And you know, Spanx operates off a zero based budget every year because Instead of there being a rolling budget, which I think can end up making companies really sloppy and not prudent and end up losing money on the bottom line unnecessarily, um, we have a zero-based budget. So every single year, everybody's budget starts at zero and they have to build a case for everything. Each leader has to build a case for everything they want to spend and they have to have an attached ROI to it, what they think the return on investment will be. And... Um, and then we make decisions that way. So, I mean, it's a culture, it's a way of life. I still am very much that way. And I can't help it too. I'll even go, isn't this something we can do ourselves? You know, they'll be like, well, Sarah, it is, but you know, maybe at this point you should let that go and not try to do it yourself. I just remember when we first started dating, uh, I was living in New York, Sarah, was, you were living in Atlanta and uh, I just sold, sold Marquee Jet, uh, this private jet company that I had started and you had, you know, you had Spanx and we were just, we just started dating and we went to, we were in Vegas and I remember you were like, at, it was 9.30, we had just gone to dinner and you were there for about 15 minutes, we were with a small group and you're like, I gotta go everybody, good night, I'm going to sleep. I'm like, it's 9.30 in Vegas. I'm like, this, you're going to bed? And you're like, yeah, I have work to do and this and that. I was like, whoa. I'm like, this is a really interesting human. And you had like, and I remember as we were going through it, like you had so much of that bootstrap in you when we first started dating. And I was like, I had a private jet company. So we were kind of like, you know, throwing big parties and entertaining clients. And you never really seen anything like that. And it was like peanut butter. It was just like completely opposite. And I was so attracted to like the grit, you know, that mentality. You've never lost it. And I think, I don't know, but I think a lot of, as it's important as people grow, <laughs> grow to keep that where I came from mentality and to never lose it. You know, you see athletes lose it. This one loses. It. So you've always stayed that clear water in you is, you know, it's still in you that small town beach girl. And it's great to watch. Let's get to a couple of more while we, we have a couple more minutes before Serena is going to jump in here. Um, okay. Cliff, Cliffy asks, what's the minimal minimum financial accounting information you should know or understand to start a business ha! i want to hear your answer on this one because <laughs> i know um, how, i know how versed you are in balance sheets and and accounting uh measures yeah it's it's not my strong suit okay um yeah i would say zero i i i just am speaking from experience i had zero I've never taken an accounting course in my life. I still never have. I've never taken a business class in my life. Um, I, I just never have. So I can, I can only tell you, it, it, I'm sure it doesn't hurt to have some. Uh, it just wasn't a part of my journey. I never took a single class on it. And I started Spanx and um, I've been able to do it without it. I, I'm very grateful for the people I have hired who do do that and understand it. And I know enough to know where my strengths and weaknesses are. And that was really a quick hire that I wanted to make early on. Uh, you know, I know you've had two very powerful women in your life as influences, your mom and your grandma, who played a huge role in you know how you were raised and i mean your mom's unbelievable she's so sweet and supportive and i think a lot of the lucille ball comes from your mom uh, <laughs> and a lot of the einstein because she's so creative as well but if you think back to your childhood and now we have four kids 
are there certain things that you're incorporating from your childhood into your parenting styles? Just getting off the business track for a second. I know your dad used to talk about failure and what did you fail out, fail at? And you had mentioned at the top of the interview, um, how do you feel in some of these things? Are there certain characteristics that you've carried into your parenting style? I mean, you always tell me and, you know, one of our things that we're aligned in is praising the effort with our kids, not the results. We really make an, you know, a, a strong point to always praise the effort. Are there any other characteristics that you think you, you're carrying over from when you were a little girl? Well, I mean, you mentioned the two, which is um, I'm definitely wanting to encourage our children to fail. My dad did that while I was growing up, and that was a really big, big plus for us. And the other one, you know, he would, he would, instead of us fearing failure, he was kind of encouraging us to go try new things. And he'd say, what did you fail at? And if we didn't have something, he'd be disappointed. And so he just reframed failure for us instead of failure being not, uh, the outcome, it became just about not trying. Um, and then praising the effort. I grew up in a family that I, it wasn't super kid centric. Like I didn't feel like I was the center of the universe um, with my parents. And I feel like, I mean, I felt very loved and very supported, but um, they, you know, they weren't, I, I, they weren't just like all day long saying you're the best and this is, you, it's amazing. So they were mostly praising my effort and I think that's really important. When you um, are telling your children they're great all day, uh, what ends up happening is it's a reverse psychology. They end up becoming so nervous and insecure that they're not gonna measure up to what you think. And they start to feel like they're gonna be found out. Like my dad and mom think I'm so great. What if I'm not that great? What if I, and so it, it's like psychologists have analyzed it now and realized that's actually been detrimental to children and the children that were praised the most all day long in that way ended up being the most fearful to, to try new things or to go out there. So um, being able to say, you know, you made a real effort and I'm super proud of the effort. That was something that my parents always did. And um, we had dinner, we had dinner religiously, Monday through Friday, and my parents talked to each other almost the whole meal, and my brother and I listened. I mean, we were allowed to talk, but it was more just my parents catching up, and that was a really um, huge part of my learning and my upbringing that I look back and value a lot. I love it. Well, we have time for one more question before I bring Serena back, sweetie. So I guess this is kind of a question for both of us, but you could take a shot out of it, shot at okay. it. Um, I Brenton asked, based on being a highly successful entrepreneur power couple, huh, what advice do you have for myself and my wife for keeping the spark alive in our marriage while we're both so preoccupied in building our own business businesses and both predominantly working from home? But we love what we do, but we can also get um, fully committed by it, consumed by it. So I think that's a common thing. People are trying to build their businesses. Yeah working at a home, they're all consumed. What advice would you, would you, you can go first. I mean, I would say you've got to find alone time, even if it's 15, 20 minutes, whatever, 10 minutes, whatever it can be, there needs to be a sacred amount of alone time between the two of you. And I would recommend that that time not be a time that you can talk about children or your businesses. Um, so that's, Number one, that's really helpful. We don't always do that, but we try. And then the second thing is try to find a mutual activity that you guys enjoy, whether it's you both like to go for a walk, you both like to ride bikes, you like to hike. I think when you can um, skip away for even a few minutes and do an actual activity, that's really healing for a marriage and keeps a marriage on track. Um, it's tough. I mean, you know, Jesse and I, it's such a balance. Sometimes he's, I can tell that he's got a much heavier workload and I'll take, take more of the responsibility in the house. And then he can kind of sense when I might have a board meeting coming up or some really big product deadlines. And he'll say, you know what, I'm going to lean in a little bit more and then dividing the responsibilities in the home and being really forthcoming about that talking about and communicating. There's been times in our marriage where it hasn't felt balanced and I felt like I was taking more of the at home stuff or Jesse did and we had to articulate it to each other and you have to do it pretty quickly 
or else it can start to build resentment. But we laugh all the time. I mean, if you can make each other laugh, it's, that's such a big part of it. I think you really, it's so important to communicate when you're out of balance. If you work, especially if you're starting a business, you're going to be out of balance. When Sarah starts to spank, she worked 20 hour days. I support 21 hour days at Marquee Jet. I let Sarah know, look, I'm training for a race. I'm launching this product. The next two weeks are going to be crazy. Can you do this? Because she hit on the most important thing is resentment. If you don't communicate that and resentment builds up, it's, it can spiral quickly. So you really want to communicate those things. Um, I'm going to bring Serena back in because we're right at nine o'clock. Um, this, was, this was hard. This was uncomfortable. This is challenging. Uh, <laughs> But I loved it. I love getting your answers. You know, some of this stuff was new. A lot of this stuff is covered in Sarah's amazing master class. So for those that haven't seen it, you could still, you know, obviously um, check that out. And like I said, it's like, it's like getting an MBA. It's like going to Harvard Business School in a couple of quick sessions. So definitely do that. And Serena, come on in. <laughs> First of all, it's like getting a, a business degree within a few sessions. And I love that we ended on a marriage therapy note. I was like, yes, I need to take some of those notes into my own marriage. <laughs> um, and Sarah, there was something that you said while shooting that has sat with me and I've revisited so many times, which is that you don't need to be serious to be taken seriously. And I just have to tell you that I have revisited that as a woman and just as a human being so many times. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you yeah. both for being here today. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us. Masterclass Live takes place this time every Wednesday. And our next guest I'm very excited to announce is Condé Nast Artistic Director, Vogue Editor-in-Chief, and Cultural Arbiter, Anna Wintour. As yeah. a reminder, while this is normally a member benefit, given what we're all going through right now, we've opened up access to everyone for the foreseeable future. We hope you'll join us. Until then, channel Sarah. Aim high <laughs> and write down those ideas. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.